Hi everybody, I'm going to kick us off as it is at 12.30. I'm Katie Jacobs from the CIPD and I'm pleased to welcome you to this, which is the final CIPD webinar of 2020. Uh, since April, we have run a lot of webinars to help the people profession cope with the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic, as well as running other series on tackling racism in the workplace and not to mention all those other webinars run by our regional teams and our branch volunteers. So there has been an awful lot of online activity since March. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling a pretty profound sense of tiredness. Um, and I hope that you are all looking forward to getting some rest this festive period, even if it's not gonna be a kind of normal Christmas. But before we get there, we're going to be tackling a topic this afternoon which I think has some links to the holidays for many of us, and that is managing conflict. Over the next hour or so, we're gonna unpack the challenges of COVID-19 generated workforce friction. We're gonna learn how to recognize the behaviors that can fuel negative conflict and identify how to nip incidents in the bud at an early stage. And discussing this topic with me this afternoon, a panel of great experts, I'm joined by Rachel Suff, Rachel is Senior Policy Advisor, Employment Relations at the CIPD, and joined by David Little, Founder and CEO of the TCM Group, which is the UK's leading mediation and resolution consultancy. And David has also literally written the book on managing conflict. He's the author of Managing Conflict, A Practical Guide to Resolution in the Workplace. Thank you both. Um, as Rachel actually has to leave just after her presentation, we've also got Abdul Wahab stepping in to join the Q&A. Abdul is Diversity and Inclusion Advisor at the CIPD, and he has a lot of experience in advising organisations on dealing with bullying and harassment, as well as in advising managers on how to informally resolve conflict. So thank you so much, Abdul, for stepping in uh, to join us for that. And now, for the very last time in 2020, I get to do the housekeeping, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you know off by heart by now, if you've attended more than one of these. Um, the session is being recorded, and you will be able to access it afterwards. The slides will also be available and my colleagues will put where you can find those in the chat. If you'd like to submit a question, and please do during the session, could I ask you to use the Q&A tab, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. But feel free to use the chat function to make any comments, to connect with each other, um, and we'll also be using the chat function to share any resources that are mentioned in the presentation that you might find useful. So do keep an eye on that. Remember that the CIPD um, Coronavirus Hub is there as a resource and they're adding things to it all the time. For legal advice, I want to remind you that CIPD members can call our HR Inform helpline. It's available 24 seven and you will get an individual response. Obviously it's not appropriate for us to take any kind of very specific questions on specific cases in, in a webinar setting. We can't give you employment law advice um, over this medium, but you can call that helpline if you need any, um, if you need any employment law advice. And finally, I want to flag our wellbeing helpline, which is available to our members in the UK and Ireland. Working with Health Assured, we're providing CIPD members with free help and support via sessions with qualified therapists, which can be accessed online or over the phone. And Health Assured have also launched a new app. The My Healthy Advantage mobile app provides an enhanced set of wellbeing tools designed to improve your mental and physical health. And you can access it anytime, anywhere. And we'll give you a little bit more details about that at the end of the session. So on to this afternoon's topic. While back in April, we were all clapping for the NHS and there was a lot of talk of us all being in this together, it has since become rather painfully clear that the coronavirus pandemic has had a far from even impact and that it has in fact created some division within the workforce. While the job retention scheme has enabled many employers to keep people on the books, many employees will be feeling anxious about job security, which can heighten tensions among the workforce. And then there's the fact that a lot of us are working remotely and that comes with all sorts of associated potential for miscommunication, which can also serve to increase tension and anxiety. But we all know too well that conflict and even bullying was a significant issue for many workplaces even before the COVID-19 crisis. CIPD research conducted earlier in 2020 found that a quarter of employees think their organisation pushes issues like bullying and harassment under the rug. And recent weeks have shown us that even the UK government is not immune to bullying accusations in the workplace at the most senior level. So how can organisations and people professionals get to grips with handling conflict at work? That's what we're going to explore today. 
So Rachel's going to give a short presentation, uh, followed by David. Rachel will be ducking off after hers, but Abdul will be joining us for Q&A. So please do get your questions in throughout, and we'll address them after the presentations. That is it from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Rachel um, to set some context. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Katie, and th thanks so, so much for joining us, everybody. I mean, it's so heartening this week, isn't it, that vaccinations have actually started in the UK to protect people against COVID-19, but it will take time for that to roll out. It's clear we're still living in very turbulent and uncertain times. We're now in economic recession. We've got a lot more redundancies to come going into 2021. We're also on the verge of Brexit and all that uncertainty. So it is clear that that will filter down into organisations, all that turbulence and organisations are facing a major employment relations challenge. And as Katie said, we know the pandemic has not had an equal impact. It's had a disproportionate impact across different employee groups, also at an individual level. People are affected, everybody's affected by the pandemic and the crisis, but they're affected in different ways. And that could be according to what sector they work in, what their job role is, for example, but also a very individual level in terms of their circumstances. And even the virus itself in terms of people's health, we know some people are at higher risk of infection than others. But also, if you've got a certain personal characteristic, you're, you're, at, you're at more risk. But then if you've got care and responsibilities or not, for example, you'll be affected differently. If you're working at home all the time or not, that's different. If you're furloughed or not, if your job could be made redundant or not. So even given all those different situations, Alongside that, many people are facing new work demands, different work routines, which really does create the potential for stress, also divisiveness and for some negative feelings and unhealthy conflict to creep into the employment relations climate. So the context, this wider context, is a very complex one for many organisations to deal with. And it's clear the road ahead will remain challenging in terms of that employment relationship going forward. Now, we knew even before the current crisis that negative conflict and unfair treatment like bullying, harassment was still a significant issue in many workplaces. And I'm just going to draw out some key findings from the research that Katie mentioned, because those findings are still really relevant today. Even though we published this research on conflict in the modern workplace, it was at the early start of the year. But they're still very relevant in terms of what were the lessons? What was the state of employment relations before we went into this crisis? And what can we learn from that to help us develop a more positive employment relations climate and deal with these challenges going forward. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So, well, first of all, it's a positive picture if, if you look at the overall findings from the survey, because employees generally report a supportive working environment. And the overwhelming majority say that working relations with colleagues were either good or very good. And three in four of employees agree that their colleagues treat people with dignity and respect. So that is what you, you want. Um, and that's the research on, on the right hand side and it's on our website if you want to take a more detailed look at it. So that was asking employees what they thought. If we look at the next slide, we also asked employers what do you think of the working environment and the culture at your organisation? And it was a similar perception. Just over three quarters, you can see 78% said good or very good. So first glance, quite positive. Next slide. So let's not forget that. But then if we scratch the surface in a bit more detail um, and really start to look a bit deeper into um, how inclusive is the culture? What, what's the, the envir environment like? We can see here that conflict in my workplace is a common occurrence according to around a quarter of employers again. So conflict is definitely a real issue in workplaces. If we move on 
And if we continue to look at what people's experiences are, we found that around a third said that they had experienced conflict. Now, either that was uh, an isolated dispute of conflict on the, on the left-hand side, around a quarter told us that, or it was an ongoing difficult relationship. So um, quite a lot of sort of different difficult personal situations for employers, employees to navigate. If we could move on. And then if we look a bit deeper again, Katie's already flagged this. We asked employees a number of questions and a quarter said that they think that challenging issues like bullying and harassment are swept under the carpet in my organisation. And that's exactly what we don't want. We need any uh, negative issues or conflict to be brought to the surface, to be discussed, to be resolved. When they are pushed under the carpet, that is when they can fester and become really harmful. And then on the second bullet, this was a jump out finding for me. It said one in five employees feel that the culture isn't inclusive and they agreed that colleagues reject sometimes others for being different. And I think that really does show how not all, not, um, it's not necessarily overt prejudice that, that uh, makes people feel isolated and not included, included but we want to have an environment in organisations that celebrate and accept everybody, regardless of background, circumstance. So really that is quite indicative, I think, of, of what some of the sort of underlying, simmering kind of not inclusive atmosphere is in organisations. And then we can see further down, 15% had experienced bull bullying, around half that harassment, not of a sexual nature, and then about 4% had experienced sexual harassment over the past uh, three years. Now, just before moving on to the next slide, just, just want to emphasize that not all conflict is negative necessarily in organizations. Actually, if it's channeled, um, in the right way, it can be productive, even innovative. But really what we're talking about here is where it's more negative conflict, where it um, really does start to harm relationships, uh, it seeps into inappropriate behavior and so on. If we could have the next slide. I'm moving on because a whole area that really came under the spotlight in this research was the role that line managers play in workplace conflict. And first of all, I mean, managers have so much responsibility on them to manage people. It's often an add on to their job and not enough are trained adequately, but it really does come across in this research that disappointingly managers can be part of the problem as well as the solution in terms of building an inclusive uh, culture in their teams and really dealing with conflict when it occurs between individuals as well. And what we found was that a line manager, when we asked employees who caused the conflict, a line manager was the person most likely to be the cause of the conflict. And also where a conflict situation was reported to a line manager, employees told us that they were just as likely to make the situation worse as better. So quite a negative role we found in, in some cases that line managers are playing in terms of managing conflict in their teams. And then if we move on to the next slide, just to explore this in a bit more detail, we asked, uh, employees, what do you think of your line manager? And this graph shows that there were some very mixed findings. I mean, it's not all negative. For example, most employees trust line managers to take their concerns seriously. Twice as likely to agree as disagree that my line manager communicates effectively with the team. So that's positive. But there's quite a lot of ambivalence reflected in these findings as well and some negative perceptions. So for example, more, dis, more agree than disagree that my line manager treats some team members more favorably than others. So these findings so taken together show that line managers need to play a more positive role in resolving conflict and building inclusive teams. If we look at the next slide, you can see this is uh, 
a reflection of, of how there needs to be much more improvement in terms of resolving conflict at work. There really is a disappointing resolution rate in terms of resolving negative conflict. So first of all, where employees did report conflict, less than half said that it had been largely or fully resolved. And also people were just as likely to be dissatisfied as satisfied with how their organisation actually handled the conflict. So that is really disappointing. You know, if employees had had the, they've had the courage, they've spoken up, they've approached the organisation, but a lot have been disappointed with how it's been handled. So if we move on to the next slide. So given those findings and the current crisis as well, and all the challenges that we've mentioned so far, how can we reframe resolution? So developing more positive and proactive ways of dealing with unhealthy conflict is even more important now, given the need to foster inclusion, support people through these challenging times. You know, the level of pressure on people will only have increased in workplaces. And it's not surprising that the latest employment tribunal statistics, for example, show that the number of claims have really increased over the past few months. Now, our research shows that it is still formal processes like grievance that still dominate in terms of how organisations respond to conflict. Now, there will be situations, uh, a very serious accusation, a really difficult situation or dispute where individuals want a formal procedure to be used or, and it's appropriate, but there is so much more scope, we can tell from that research we carried out, to encourage more early, more positive, more problem solving uh, ways to, to resolve disputes between individuals at work. And the research did show quite a lot of openness and willingness on the part of both employers and employees to embrace a more early informal problem solving approach. And I think that's very encouraging. So there are signs that a lot of organizations are training managers in having difficult conversations. Um, HR is doing more facilitated discussion and troubleshooting and so on. And mediation is used as well. Because we know that policies and procedures have their place, but they need to know their place. And I think the trouble is when you use policies and procedures as the default and you use them too quickly all the focus then in that situation can be on the actual procedure and it become can become very adversarial rather than on the real problem which is underlying the conflict and it's often more conversation more talking and so on that can really get to the heart of what the real problem is so organizations can be guided by policy definitely but not bound by it. If we have the next slide, please. So on, on that note, a, a really key area where employers should invest more is in supporting line managers to play a positive role because they really are at the cold face here. They are in their teams. They are going to be the ones that can spot conflict, that can encourage com conversations, that can uh, be alert to any signs of tension in their team. And we know that there is a big gap in terms of the expectation that employers and HR as well place on them day to day to manage those team relationships and the actual investment in their skills and their behaviour as well to build the right kind of relationships. These are some guiding principles on what their role should be. And there's more detail on this in a guide on our website that we, I've signposted to on the last slide. So just to give you a flavour here of what ideally the role of a line manager is. I mean, first of all, they need to know their team. They need to foster good working relationships in the first place. This means getting to know people as individuals, appreciating the personal pressures that might be affecting them at work as well, especially at the moment. And then secondly, it does mean monitoring team relationships in a positive way, not an intrusive way, so that they are alert to any of those similar intentions that can tip over into more serious conflict, so that they can nip any negative conflict in the bud. 
and they shouldn't be afraid to challenge any inappropriate behaviour when it does emerge. And it does take confidence to, to play that role as a line manager. So that's why they really do need to train in the support. They need to understand what, the, what their role is and how they should go about managing difficult situations like conflict. And then thirdly, by having regular one-to-ones and encouraging those informal conversations and feedback, um, they can really help um, spot any difficult situations of conflict and also create the sort of environment where people feel comfortable to discuss their concerns or any issue that's becoming a problem. So those informal conversations um, are, re are really important. And then the fourth sort of guiding principle, it's about setting expectations and acting as a role model because line managers will really set the tone and senior managers as well, of course, in a positive way in terms of how people in that team will behave towards each other. And that does mean very visibly day to day living the organisation's values around dignity and respect, treating every individual with the same level of importance, not being sucked into office politics, respecting people's point of view and so on. Then finally, it's about that intervening early piece to help resolve conflict in a positive and informal way. And that does mean being proactive and not leaving things in the too difficult box. And it can be daunting for a manager to, to deal with conflict and recognize when it is tipping over into something more harmful. It takes confidence and it takes skill being that impartial third party teasing out what the uh, real issues are at play here and sometimes it is enough for, for an informal conversation and bringing those parties together in a really informal way if it's at an early stage because sometimes people don't appreciate the impact that their behavior can have um, or that their behavior has tipped into something that's not acceptable if we have the final slide thank you so two key takeaways on my final slide. Here's the research that I've drawn on. First of all, formal policies and procedures need to know their place. And then just returning to the line manager piece, because I, I think that could make be such a game changer in organizations, having line managers that are confident and capable in this space. And as well as being able to recognize negative conflict, challenge it, resolve, help resolve it, it's also very much about how line managers behave as well and in terms of how they play that positive role. So based on years and years of research at CIPD, we have very recently in the last week or so published new guidance for line managers based on the kind of behaviours that they need to display to manage conflict, to build inclusive teams and that guidance is signposted here in um in the box and it's about being open fair consistent and how you can create the kind of management development program really and reinforce those behaviors amongst line managers in their organizations so do um tap into those resources and the research as well on our website thank you Thank you very much um, for that, Rachel, uh, and thanks for, for joining and we'll, we'll see you next time. Um, the, um, the slides will be available later today, I can see somebody asking for that, and also my colleagues have been putting in all the useful links that Rachel mentioned in case you want to access any of them now. Um, thank you for putting in your questions, we will come to those after David's presentation, but feel free to, um, to add some more in as he's talking. Over to you, David. Katie, thank you so much. I mean, what a fantastic presentation from Rachel. And I also think, and she, she didn't mention, I also think it's worth referencing the CIPD HR profession map, outcome-oriented, principles-led, um, uh, and real focus there on how the profession map can actually provide a blueprint and a methodology by which you can resolve disputes. I think we should congratulate the CIPD for the focus on management capability and competence and also the profession map, which does, as I, as I see it, provide a real blueprint 
for the HR profession for managing conflict. So thanks, Katie, for inviting me to be part of today's session, looking at how organisations can manage conflict effectively and integrate conflict management systems and, and approaches into their COVID recovery and resolution strategy, which I know a great many of you are thinking about and, and are developing right now as we plan for, with our fingers firmly crossed, we plan for the future of early 2021, getting back to some new normal. Next slide, please, Christian. So a little bit about the TCM group. So we specialize in providing conflict resolution and mediation services very much as Katie said at the, at the introduction. Very pleased we uh, were awarded HR Consultancy of the Year at the Personnel Today Awards um, uh, earlier this year, well, in, in November, uh, a real privilege to be part of that. And I think it shows that the HR profession and perhaps organizations more widely are starting to recognize and adopt alternative dispute resolution, mediation and restorative justice and that this approach is now becoming mainstream and recognised within organisations. So my background, personally, I'm a mediator and a restorative justice practitioner, and I've been running the TCM group for over 20 years now in helping organisations to integrate systems and approaches for managing conflict effectively. Next slide, please. I hope over the course of today's uh, presentation, I'll be sharing with you some thoughts. I'm gonna start off by looking, I'm gonna get the bonnet up on conflict. What's going on when conflict happens, the anatomy and the psychology of conflict. And I hope from that you'll develop some actions to help you understand what's happening when people are in conflict and giving you some tools to help you to be able to handle those situations uh, differently. I'm also then going to move into how I think HR profession, you know, bearing in mind what Rachel said about policies and procedures, one thing is for certain you cannot resolve a conflict by applying a GBH policy framework, GBH, grievance, bullying and harassment. So if uh, the, the policy frameworks are important, but the current systems are broken, dysfunctional, divisive, pernicious, insidious, you choose, choose the adjective to describe them, um, then we can look at an alternative system. So looking at HR to be courageous as we move into the new normal and reframe some of the policy frameworks to adopt that outcome oriented resolution focus. So hopefully share with you some action plans to help you as you're reframing your HR policies to create a culture of resolution. And also, I will um, be sharing five tips to help uh, managers and HR professionals to get better outcomes from conflict and, and resolution. So I hope that that will give you some useful actions to take away and embed in your own organisations. Next slide, please, Christian. So let's start off by looking at what happens underneath the surface. What's going on when we experience a conflict? Next slide, please, Christian. So here we have two people in conflict. He's not performing to the standards that she's expecting. She's very frustrated with him. He's um, you know, feeling very micromanaged, very undervalued, under supported and not listened to. And, and in technical conflict management terms, he's having what's known as a proper big sulk. And he is not feeling particularly happy. Now, this situation is a perfectly normal, natural and healthy expression in any workplace. This stuff goes on in every organisation up and down the country. It's not the conflict which is dysfunctional or destructive. It's how we begin to manage it. So let's think a little bit about what's going on under the surface for our two colleagues here. Next slide, please. The first thing that we see very quickly is that the two parties become, they adopt quite a binary and polarized and positional view of the situation and of each other. I'm right, you're wrong. I win, you lose. I defend, you attack or vice versa. And of course we know that the best form of defense is attack. So the situation becomes very binary and polarized. And actually what we look around the here in the organization is someone to help us, a manager, as Rachel rightly said, confident, competent, courageous managers to help me have the conversation. Maybe I look to the HR department and ask for a process, a system, a mechanism to be able to resolve this. What we actually find for our managers is they engage in, in actions, which I will describe broadly as extensive inaction, or expensive overreaction. We don't get the action we need. We look at the HR function, and unfortunately the quasi litigation styled discipline and grievance procedures actually worsen this because of course they require the parties to engage in black and white thinking in order for the organization to get to 50 plus 1% balance of probability to see whether a situation can be resolved. So the organization systems, the failure to act and the formal policy and procedures actually create further polarity, further polarization, and actually enhance this methodology, this, this, this mindset that's been developed. 
Next slide, please, Christian. But what's really happened, and we all know, we, everyone here knows, we've all been in conflict before. We know conflict isn't black and white. We know conflict isn't the Birchell test. We know it isn't 51%. We know there's a lot more going on underneath the surface. And as a mediator and someone who's worked with many hundreds, if not thousands of people in conflict, I know that under the surface, people are experiencing needs that haven't been met, the need to be valued, to be heard, to be treated with dignity, to be treated with respect, with civility, to be to given information openly and transparently within the organization. And when those needs aren't met, we experience a profound sense of loss. And those, that, that loss can be a, an actual loss. I might lose a colleague, I might lose some resources. It could be a perceived loss, a loss of esteem, a loss of position, a loss of influence, a loss of power. And the important driver in conflict terms is a fear of future loss. We anticipate a loss down the line. And of course, people are intelligent, they're smart. So they start to develop conflict resolution strategies based on an anticipated future loss. And of course, that sense of losing something, we all know the, you know, Birchell, uh, the, the, the Kubler-Ross uh, grief curve, the change curve, of course, those result in acceptance, as we know, in conflict, we don't get into acceptance, it just goes on and on and on. So we have this amygdala, I'll talk more about that, we see this as a persistent threat, it creates these emotional and psychological responses, the cortisol response, the adrenaline response, and that drives how we act, how we interact and how we react, the air, that we breathe out and that we breathe in. And of course, the further up the organization, the way we act, interact and react defines the character, the climate and the culture of the organization. So I'm talking in particular about leaders, but it's actually very much across our teams, how our managers, how our colleagues and how the teams act, interact and react. And the outward sign of this is destructive behavior. So if all we do is we focus on the behavior and is the behavior bad enough to be able to take an action or, 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 or take a sanction, then we're missing an awful lot of information that's been going on beneath the surface. And one of the tools, one of the actions, one of the, the strategies I think is important for managing conflict is to really listen, to listen to understand what's really going on for the parties. And the magic of this process is party A, who thinks the other person is the devil incarnate, a bully, evil, nasty, dreadful, should be sad, tells me that they, they, they don't feel respected and valued. And I speak to this devil incarnate and this bully and this, this harasser and terrible person. And they tell me, I don't feel respected. I need to feel respected. And what's really interesting as we listen for meaning and we start to look for convergence rather than divergence and create a high growth rather than a fixed mindset in the parties, it turns out they both need the same thing. And this is what's really fascinating in conflict resolution terms. We often in our systems and processes focus on divergence and what's different and what's difficult, not what brings the parties together. And it's that getting to yes, the principled, that, that, the principled negotiation, which I think is a key tool in dealing with some of these issues. Next slide, please, Christian. So when conflict goes wrong, as I've mentioned, it gives a sense of loss. And what we often find as HR professionals, as managers, as leaders and others, we're presented with the uncertainty, the fear, the suspicion, the stress, the cliques, the alliances, the disengagement, the rumours. Each one of those, the antecedent to each of those is a loss. If we can understand the loss, we can begin to reframe the loss as a need. So the loss of control, I need to have control. How can I give you control? Well, I can give you a space to have a dialogue and a conversation. I can help you to find a remedy and a resolution. I can help you listen and to be heard. I can help you to give you some voice and, and agency in the resolution process, give you a sense of purpose and clarity. And actually by helping the parties to resolve the issues, it begins to meet their need and resolve the issue of loss. Next slide, please, Christian. And conflict, unfortunately, it tricks us into behaving badly. We see the other person as a threat. We go into, into survival instinct, the fight, flight, freeze or fall uh, approach, as, as I've said, that, that's driven by this, the cortisol release. And what's happened, unfortunately, is we're stressed, we're anxious, we're not sleeping, we're worried, we're feeling uh, vulnerable, isolated. Goodness me, aren't we all feeling that at the moment? And then we go to our HR department and we say, I'm feeling stressed, vulnerable, isolated. And we say, yeah, not, not a problem at all. We'll help you. And what do we do? We get a great big bucket of cortisol. We tip it over their head. And now we say, did that help? And can you now please provide a rational response to the situation? And what we do and the systems that we have for resolving conflict in our organizations, unfortunately, 
provoke, encourage, and promote an increasing stressor response. And in order to be able to resolve conflict effectively, we be, need to begin to change the system. And to do that, perhaps, go back to our grievance procedures, our disciplinary procedures, and with a big C, mark all the part of your policies that release a cortisol response in the individual. That's going to result in a fixed mindset, and it's going to result in, in stressors. And with a D, mark all the bits which result, uh, release dopamine, the positive hormone. I bet there's very little D and there'll be a lot of C. Now, what we want to do is to promote a high growth mindset, not a closed stressor response. Maybe a bit of neuroscience could be useful in the way we develop our policies on this stuff. Okay, next slide, please, Christian. So we talked a lot about the F words, fight, flight, freeze, fall, fear, failure. I mean, it's goodness me, that's, don't worry, Kate, I'm not going to use that many F words, but there's a lot of F words when it comes to dealing with conflict. Here's a lovely F word that we love, flow. This comes from positive psychology, the work of Martin Seligman and others to promote flow. And it's about building happiness and it's thinking about the individual, but we can apply this into an organizational and also a, a, a human dynamics perspective where it's a flow of ideas, of empathy, of understanding. Next slide, please, Christian. A flow of mutual respect, a flow of trust, a flow of ideas, bringing people together. And perhaps the role of the HR function, the union function, the management function, the triumvirate of the organization should be about enhancing and increasing flow and reducing the, the likelihood of the fight or flight response. And the beauty of that is, as we increase flow, so we start to see an increase in engagement, in happiness, in productivity. And I would argue that flow and the management of conflict, effective management of conflict, is a key driver of high performance and high productivity. And again, this will be a massive focus for us in the new normal. Next slide, please, Christian. So, so, so conflict is a neutral situation. We're all experiencing it all of the time. It's not the conflict that's bad. I love conflict. I'm just going to put it out there. I think conflict can be, as Rachel said, absolutely agree. It can be a driver of productivity, performance, engagement. It can growth, insight, learning, all the stuff that we need to drive a transformational culture in our organizations. It's not the conflict that's the bad. It's the choices we make and the way that it's managed. And if we're going to see conflict become a functional, constructive part of our organizations where it brings about meaning, insight, learning, growth, and, and productivity, we need to think about how we manage it and the choices we make. And it's on the HR function to help people make the right choices because they will make, we have a great capacity as human beings to make wrong choices. We need people somewhere to help us make the right choices. We also have an, a great and an incredible capacity as human beings when we're presented with the right opportunities to make different choices. But I need someone in my organization to help me to do that. And I'll say one thing for certain, GBH does not help me make the right choices, grievance, bullying, and harassment. Next slide, please, Christian. This is just for the chat function, really, to get us thinking about this. So I'm going to ask you to think, I'm out, I won't spend too long on this, but just to get you thinking about your own experiences of conflict, what we've just talked about, does it sort of strike any chords with you based on what you've had to deal with in the past? If I could give you a time machine and the benefit of hindsight, wow, wouldn't that be great? But if I could give you a time machine to go back in time, now we know what we know about conflict, what might you do differently in the way that you handle it? Please do feel free to share in the chat function any thoughts, reflections, ideas that you'd like to share about things that you might have done differently if you go back in time to a particular situation that you've, that you've faced in the past. Okay, so that's the chat function open. Again, feel free to share and no doubt colleagues would really value hearing your insights and your wisdom. Next slide, please, Christian. Okay, so the, the, the second part of my presentation is, is, is calling out really the, the policy frameworks that exist, the traditional policy frameworks that exist. I do, I, I'll get off the, the fence. You probably heard me describing them, pernicious, corrosive, insidious, damaging, divisive. I would say they're wicked, mean, nasty, and they are the antithesis of kind, the antithesis of compassionate, and they're the antithesis of a just, fair, and inclusive environment. So I'm going to move into what I think organizations and HR might do differently to handle this stuff. Next slide, please, Christian. We, we cannot resolve, and, and again, if you've got any examples, uh, please do share. And I've been talking about this now for over 10 years, and I talked at events, workshops, and I'm always asking the same question. 
Have you got any examples of where you've applied a grievance, bullying or harassment policy or a disciplinary procedure uh, where in the organisation it's added value to the organisation, it's added value to the individual's working lives, it's added value in terms of created harmony, productivity, engagement and a propensity towards increased performance. And I'd love to hear some examples because I'm still waiting for just one. I'm just waiting for one. And by the way, ticking the box on procedural fairness and being able to demonstrate you followed the procedure in the employment tribunal, I'm afraid doesn't count. So um, it needs to be demonstrating real value. My experience is the traditional grievance, bullying, harassment frameworks undermine relationships. They tear the heart out of teams. They create fear, anxiety, and uncertainty at the very time when people are at their most vulnerable. Next slide, please, Christian. So the systems are reactive and reductive. I talked about that right right polarity. They, they invoke that within the, within the individuals and perpetuate that. People are always feeling wrong-footed. They're always feeling on the back foot and feeling that they're having to defend themselves. They're more concerned about mitigating risk to ensure that we stand up in the tribunal when that might happen versus actually motivating, managing and supporting people. They're designed, they are really designed for the tiniest minority of people in the workforce rather than designed for the majority. They're a one size fits all approach. It's, it's like reaching into the toolbox and trying to resolve every problem in your house with a hammer. And if the only tool we have in our toolbox is a hammer, every problem is a nail and our employees are not nails. <laughs> They're hardworking, motivated, loyal, decent people who've worked their socks off during COVID. They don't want to come back into our workplaces and be smacked over the head with a hammer. They want a more sophisticated, nuanced response in the workplace because they've been delivering a more nuanced and, uh, a, a, and flexible response to you and to their employers. They're in, in, intrinsically adversarial, they create the fight. And actually we have to ask ourselves, who really benefits from this stuff? They're binary, they rarely get to the root cause of what's going on, in fact, very, very rarely, if ever. The needs of the individual and the business, I mean, I can't believe businesses for so long have simply sat by and allowed this stuff to go on under their noses. It just shocks me. The money, the time, the effort, the waste, it is shocking and terrible and really, really does need to be called out. They get in the way of creativity, innovation, a high growth mindset, and they perpetuate the kind of culture that is undermining the organization. That now might be okay if you're trading into a big trading block on your doorstep, which we won't be doing from the 1st of January. Come on, UK PLC, we need to be better at dealing with this stuff and motivating our people to get better outcomes. Next slide, please, Christian. So the kind of framework that, that big companies, Aviva, TSB, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, we're working with London Ambulance Service, they're adopting resolution frameworks. And the resolution framework that we, what we, what, that we help organisations to, to implement replaces the disciplinary and grievance procedure in its totality. It, it removes us away from those uh, procedures. It's fully compliant with the ACAS code, which very simply put means you know, meet the individual, give them the right to be accompanied, give them the right to appeal. But the big focus is on the values of the organization. It's outcomes oriented, it's person centered, promoting dialogue at the earliest possible stages. It brings together the triumvirate. So it's a real focus on modern form of pluralism, HR management union working together before not after a situation to develop resolution hubs within organizations. It begins with a triage process. So using a set of objective criteria, each case is assessed on its own merit and then is determined, to, in essence, a, a particular route to resolution is identified in each case based on the merits and the score for that particular case. That may well be you know, a conversation, a facilitated conversation, mediation, and in more serious cases, an investigation or suspension. There's no longer warnings in those organizations. They use reminders. There's no longer hearings. They have resolution meetings. Resolution meetings using a restorative conferencing or family group, group conferencing model. It's about all stakeholders working together to seek resolution. It's about identifying and sustaining re resilience. It's about HR or people and culture supporting the process. It's about finding effective remedies for those cases on a case by case basis. Much greater use of coaching, restorative justice, 
facilitated conversations. And this begins to really underpin the transformational culture. I must mention, Kate, if I may, the book I'm working on right now for Kogan Page is called Transformational Culture. And it's a practical guide to developing a fair, just and inclusive culture in the workplace. That's, that's due to be published in September 2021. Next slide, please, Christian. So my final sort of couple of slides really, here are my top tips for, for managing conflict effectively. Give the other person a jolly good listening to. Listen to hear, listen to understand. Let them know that you're listening to them. Listening is the most profoundly powerful thing we do. And unfortunately, we might think we're good at it, but my experience when we go into organizations is we're listening to defend, not listening to understand. Put yourself in the other person's shoes and let them know you're doing it. Managers often, or people say to me, well, the manager's not you know, emotionally intelligent, don't show empathy. It's easily done. I, I could say, let me put myself in your shoes and try and understand what you're saying. We could actually say it, it's called cognitive empathy. And watch the other person fall over backwards when you do it. But when we ask people, how does it feel for them to have, the empathetic, have someone be an empathetic and understanding, they get real, real, um, uh, positive response, a really positive reaction to it. Don't tut. You know, we have a real culture in our organizations, boss bashing, management by tutting. You know, there's a lot of this goes on. It's not good. Don't judge, evaluate, blame, or assume. Ask questions, be curious, check in with people, give people the chance and space to speak up, speak up and listen up. What a fantastic thing we can do. Don't attack the person. The person's not the problem, the problem's the problem and how quickly we attach the problem to the person. It's not them. They're doing a hard job in hard circumstances, being the best person that they can be. Behind every behavior is a positive intention. Go and find the intention. Be curious, be interested, but don't attack them. Is they're not the problem. They, the problem is. And finally, the positions that they've adopted, don't just concern yourselves with those. Get underneath the surface, focus on their interests and their underlying needs. So those are my five tips really, and they build on obviously the tips and techniques that Rachel has shared. And really for me, these should be the core competencies of every manager. If our managers aren't using positive psychology, if they're not using behavioral science, emotional intelligence, principled negotiation, nonviolent communication, if we're not giving our managers the schools, the skills to handle this stuff, then the organization is negligent in the way that they're supporting managers. If we don't support managers to do this stuff, the organization is putting managers at risk and is knowingly perpetuating destructive and dysfunctional conflict in the workplace. Mm. And if that's the kind of organization we want to have, then, then that's fine. But if we want to do things differently, we need to support our line managers to do this stuff better. Next slide, please, Christian. So a bit of further reading. That's my text, Katie. Thank you for referencing that, Managing Conflict. Just Culture by Sydney Decker. Fantastic, really good book about integrating a restorative, not a retributive culture. Discipline without um, punishment, I must acknowledge that text for the, um, the idea for reminders rather than warnings came from that. But that's a brilliant book and has some great examples of how to manage performance issues and other issues without resorting to, to formal uh, sanction-based models and managing conflict in the modern workplace. Of course, Katie, one should nod to the fantastic work that you've been doing at the CIPD to shine a light on this particular issue. Next slide, please, Christian. So be innovative. There's never been a better time to approach this stuff. You know, the conflicts from the 20, before the 23rd of March, they haven't gone away. There's zombie conflicts that's coming to the surface. Be creative and innovative. If you apply the same old systems that you were using before lockdown, expect the same results. I think there's a famous saying about that somewhere, isn't there? About expecting different things with the, applying the same approach. So, you know, rip it up. Put the people and your values at the center and build outwards from there. It's, but put the values in there, ensure your values are in, embedded into your policy framework, support your managers and leaders, and join the resolution revolution. You'll never look back. There's what better time to be doing things differently. Final slide, please, Christian. So that's me. I'm really happy to take any questions. I'm happy to take questions now, of course, and um, you can track me down via those normal routes as well. So Katie, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present today, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, fascinating and so much information there. So I'm sure people will be rushing to download the slides. Just want to read a couple of the, the comments that people put in the chat in response to your mm. questions. Um, somebody reflecting that the last two grievance cases they've been involved with finished with dismissals. 
and res or resignation, but neither resolve the business cultural behavior. Yes. Um, the point that you made about focusing on divergence rather than bringing people together is really key. Grievance yep. process, nothing but invoke fear on both parties. Mm. Uh, people reflecting that they wish if they could have their time again with the conflict, they would uh, look at the issue from the point of view of the other party, yes. escalate stuff more quickly rather than brushing it under, under the rug and just hoping it would go away. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna come to Q&A now. Thanks for, for putting those in. Uh, and Abdul is gonna join us for that. Abdul, could you take yourself off mute? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so the, um, the first question, I'll put this to you first, um, Abdul. How do you deal with and identify targeted bullying of one person, especially, I guess, in a remote first world where you might not be able to observe it? Um, so, so for me, I mean, I mean, obviously, that's a, that's a very uh, sort of specific uh, question. I mean, the, the link to what um, Rachel sort of outlined in terms of line managers and, and you know, similar to what David's saying, uh, we need to prepare line managers to be able to deal with people. So, I mean, in, you know, it'll be, it'll be a long answer, but to, to sort of set the scene, what we need to have uh, managers to understand firstly, when someone takes on line management responsibility, that they're actually managing people, they need to be aware of that. So normally what happens in organizations is, is that someone's a functional expert in, in whatever they are, whether it's IT, whether it's sales, and uh, as a result of the experience, have got promoted to a team leader role or, or or another role where they're actually responsible now for managing people. And they're never actually taught how to go about managing people and that people are very different from other resources and you know, have emotions and, and you know, may react to things in, in an emotional way. So firstly, managers need to be prepared on how to manage people, how to uh, sort of identify all the things that Rachel said, how they go about actually identifying conflict and, and so on. And in terms of, you know, whether it's one person or whether it's a number of people, it's, it's firstly to have your regular one-to-ones with people so that you can actually speak to them. When you're having your regular one-to-ones, what happens in one-to-ones with managers and their team members is that they just talk about work-related targets, how you're getting on in the work, have you completed this assignment, but also ask about how you're getting on as a person, how are your relationships with your team? Um, if you've identified, you know, someone's quite quiet at a team meeting, then, you know, in your next one-to-one, -one, take that up, you know, what's happening, is there is there something you'd like to bring up? And through that sort of collaborative conversation, it'll help you identify any potential issues that there are at the outset. And then once you identify that there is an issue, you know, whether it's targeted bullying, whether it's banter, whether it's, you know, it goes on to harassment, then you start to address that issue and deal with it at that point. So in, in terms of identifying the actual question, is have that regular conversation with your team members and ask about things that are not just work related or task related, but also as a person, how they're getting on with their work in the physical space. Uh, ask about their well being, you know, especially in this sort of COVID and, and remote setup. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I'd advise is you know, regularly have conversation where you're asking people about their own well being, how they're getting on with work, any potential problems that they're facing. And through those conversations, you'll start to draw out uh, any potential issues that they're facing. And the more you have asked those questions, and, and you know, initially, if, if it's a new team, there might not be that trusting relationship or rapport. But the more you ease into those conversations, the more you'll draw out of people. So it's having those sort of conversations on a regular basis will allow you to identify uh, those sort of potential people who are being targeted. It might not be because they're bullying. You know, someone might be quiet in a meeting for other personal circumstances or, or, or another unrelated sort of reason, but at least by having that conversation, you can draw out what the underlying problems are. So that would be my sort of advice is conversations, ask about their personal uh, uh, sort of um, not the sort of social side of, you know, working in a team, as well as the work related uh, kind of performance management side. Thank you. I think um, that kind of point about I, I feel working remotely helps kind of hinders those kind of conversations sometimes because you end up being quite transactional and just having very project based based conversations. So it's a really great reminder to build in that kind of more well-being or social focused interaction. Um, David, a, a question um, I'll put to you yes. that often there are cases where it's HR that is the problem or senior executive senior management who are accused or deemed to have been bullying do you believe there needs to be a kind of new approach for managing such cases so that the people in these roles aren't marking their own homework 
or influencing others to turn a blind eye. So how do we deal when it's people in positions of influence or who are meant to be making things better that are actually part of the problem? I think it's a, I mean, it's a really great, and it kind of, to an extent, goes to the, to the same question as well, because I think the last, last question, the, 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 that slightly out of fashion term came to mind, the psychological contract, that trust, that communication, that mutual respect that happens between the manager, the, the, the unwritten rules, the expectations that aren't clearly written down, but are understood. But actually, if we see those, um, those contracts breaking down across the organisation, it's role modelling the wrong behaviours. And we look to our leaders, we look to our HR professionals, our managers, and union colleagues and others to model the right behavior. They create the climate by which those local issues are occurring. So we need our HR teams, we need our managers and leaders to be, to be better, to role model the right behaviors. And the way to do that is first and foremost is to in incorporate the values into how they're behaving and align their behaviors to those core values. I think for HR, is if HR are the custodians, and this is a real kind of paradox I think we see within the HR function, HR is the drivers of engagement, of, of performance, of talent, but also the custodians of policies and procedures, which um, at, least, at best hang as a sword of Damocles, but at worst destroy relationships and undermine situations. And there's a real discourse that needs to be had within the HR function about which of those two does it want to be, because I don't think it can be both. And I think by HR aligning its policy frameworks and the management systems that it develops with, with line managers and others towards and veering those towards the values and driving engagement actually creates clarity and certainty about what the function of HR is. So I, I think there is a, a real focus here and an opportunity for HR to take a real lead within organizations as the drivers of people and culture, really understanding the needs of people, understanding the needs of the workforce and aligning the culture of the organization to the core values and embedding management systems, which actually promote creativity, innovation, or what I would call happy, healthy, harmonious and higher performing workforces. So, so I think there's a great, there's a great opportunity, but it does, this does present for me an existential threat to <laughs> HR. If we don't resolve this paradox, I think people are really confused. What is it exactly HR stands for now? And I think that's a real challenge there. And, and building on that and to throw in another question, um, Abdul, um, uh, David mentioned the importance of kind of the values and behaviours. In HR, how do you kind of make sure that those behaviours are being applied throughout the organisation and not just by a few kind of the person's use of the term brave managers? So how do you assess behaviour? So essentially, I mean, if, if you're what David pro proposes is, is a whole kind of whole scale um, cultures change within an organization in terms of how they view conflict, how they deal with conflict. So, you know, it, it's got to be part of, a, a, it, it can't be something that's, you know, just bought in drips and drabs. If you're going to do something like that, then it needs to be organization wide. It needs to be part of a change management process. And as part of that, you, you build in some safeguards on, on how you go about monitoring whether the behavior is changing. And, and part of that might be sort of what I was saying in terms of building into uh, people managers' uh, roles in their KPIs, uh, targets around people management targets about around sort of conflict reduction so that then those can be those checks and balances can be applied so you know th there are you know mechanisms that you can put in place to check on that but it, it, it's a much much larger question than just HR checking on it it needs to be part of a, a sort of strategic change management process that we're going to go from uh, you know kind of this is the as the GBH approach, as uh, David puts it, we're going to change our approach, and and this is a uh, you know kind of a change management piece that we need to do that has someone's leading it, it has buy-in, you know, it, and and people are sort of brought into it. So it's not something that's imposed on managers. Line managers also need to buy into it. So it needs to be part of a project that an organization does and rolls out over a period of time and within that they can build in those checks and balances like putting the, the targets and, and and so on for uh, conflict reduction within the manager's sort of KPIs so th that, I suppose it's a roundabout way of answering the question but I'd say it's not just a case of putting in those checks and balances but it needs to be part of a whole process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, David question here um, what are your thoughts on where you have a situation where one person's robust management style or way of uh, way of communicating is another person's feeling bullied. How do you how do you deal with that? Uh, and, I mean, it's a it's a common theme. And again, it goes back to the point I think that Abdul was responding to around what what it means to be a manager in the organisation and how we receive management. 
I think there's that kind of, you almost get that divergence is, is it's robust management perspective of the manager. I'm just trying to do my job and for the individual it's landing badly. You know, what's going on underneath the surface? What is it the manager's trying to say? And again, we know that managers and, you know, picking up on, on a point Abdul was making, we need to invest on the entire life cycle of our managers and supporting them and training them so they can give clear messages to their, in, to their employees about performance, about driving performance and having better quality conversations. I talked about a culture of tutting. I see that everywhere. We, we have the conversation in our head. We want to give the feedback and it comes out as a tut. It comes out as a pejorative statement. It comes out as a, you are not doing this rather than I need you to do this. We don't look for areas of collaboration. We look for areas of, of, of blame. And, you know, we, we, we need to, to you, as, as, as Gandhi said, I mean, you know, it might be, might be a bit cheesy, but you, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist, yet we go forward with these fists. It's confrontational. And we have this confrontational and, and competitive culture. So I understand the dichotomy and I understand the, the, the point of the question. For me as a mediator, what I'm trying to do is understand what it is to help the parties to define what is it you're trying to say? What is it that you need? Listening to the other person, reflecting back and summarizing what the other person is saying, trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes, modifying and moderating what you're saying so it doesn't come across as an attack, it comes across as an opportunity. It's not a demand, it's a request. So, and managers can be doing this themselves and they need support. And again, I think it goes to the HR function. Does the HR function hold the process which is remedial when things go wrong? Or do we coach and mentor and mediate and facilitate those kind of conversations? It's a really great opportunity for HR to step in and help to break down. Because that, that difference of opinion, roast bus management versus bullying, it's happening up and down the country mm -hmm. and it needs, it needs resolving. It needs, it needs help resolving it. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw it to a close there because I'm already uh, run us one minute over. <laughs> I'm afraid that is all we've got time for today. Thank you so much to David. Thanks, Abdul, for stepping in. And uh, Rachel has left, but thank you for her <laughs> as well. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And for those of you who've been with us since April, I recognise some names that pop up almost every single webinar. Thank you so much for your engagement. And we really hope that these sessions have been a helpful source of support for you as you've dealt with what I think is probably one of the most, if not the most challenging, um, years in the history of your careers. So I really hope that you get a well-deserved break over the holidays and we're going to be back in January. So look out for a, a series of webinars we're doing in January focused on helping you build your HR career. So those um, launch on the 11th of January when they are available now to sign up to. And we've also got a session on the 14th of January focused on post-Brexit talent planning. Uh, that's also available to sign up to now. Um, so do look out for information about those over our various social media channels or landing in your inbox. Um, but that is it for now. That is us done for 2020. Thank you so much for watching. Um, goodbye and do take care of yourselves.